I am talking today about trendy marketing, leveraging the things your customers already care about. Um, at the highest of levels, what I'm talking about here, and there's a word I put trendy in quotes, essentially to say that we live in a society now where there are so many competing constraints for our attention, right? Whether it's a TikTok video or a Netflix show or some meme or email or, or whatever it is that's competing for our attention. And we as marketers need to spend less time fighting with those things and more time embracing those things and leveraging those things. So that's what I mean by trendy marketing. I mean, taking advantage of trends. So I'll tell you just super quickly about myself. I spent about a decade working for Google, the first five years of my career out at Google's headquarters in California, another five years with Google here in DC. Pretty much always my core role was related to digital marketing. My, when I started, my clients were tech companies. My clients were GoPro and Fitbit and Otterbox. Moved to DC, worked more with nonprofits, trade associations, the federal government, uh, just helping them with their digital strategies, helping them with digital marketing, uh, all that sort of good stuff. I left Google about three years ago, started my own company where I still do all that fun consulting stuff and marketing. And I do a lot of this. I travel all over the world giving speeches. Um, so this is your second conference in person. This is probably my 20th this year. Um, so I, I bounce around a lot. I talk to a lot of different audiences. It's very interesting being at a digital marketing conference because you guys on average are about maybe 25 years younger than my average audience of people. Um, it's interesting. I talk to a lot of boards of directors and um, that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm used to being in rooms where everyone in the audience is a 60 year old white guy. Um, so I'm excited to be with, with young people who probably understand some of the stuff I'm gonna talk about and embrace it and are excited about it. Uh, so again, looking forward to talking with you all. Okay, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the coronavirus. I know we're all tired of the coronavirus. I just wanna say one thing about the coronavirus. And I'm gonna use the same picture of the coronavirus. I don't know what this is, it's like a, a molecule or I don't know, but this is the picture we all use when we talk about coronavirus, I'm using it. Um, the thing that's fascinating to me about the coronavirus as someone who studies marketing and consumer behavior and thinks about these sorts of things is two things. One, the way the coronavirus massively changed every aspect of our lives and all of our lives globally. It was really an amazing thing. And we talk about it as this once in a lifetime, once in a generation, world changing event. The other thing that strikes me about coronavirus is when I hear people say that as a once in a lifetime world changing event, is I've already lived through like 30 once in a lifetime world changing events, right? Whether it's September 11th or financial collapses or the proliferation of new technologies like social media and smartphones. I'm 33, I'm, I'm a relatively young guy. I've lived through dozens of events that drastically changed the world overnight. That was not something we could say about most previous generations. Technology and globalization has gotten the world to this place where it can change and reinvent itself faster than at any point in human history. We've never changed as quickly as we change now. And with that, consumers are changing faster than they've ever changed before. People look different, they act different, they have different preferences, different beliefs, different shopping patterns, different things they care about. And those things move and change quickly. We have these whole new generations of people. This is like the generic picture that pops up if you Google millennials. Um, any self-identified millennials? That's what I am, I'm a millennial. Gen Z's, do we have any Gen Z's? Gen Z's, Gen Z's in the house. Um, well, for those of you who aren't millennials or Gen Z's, well, for those of you who are older than millennials, I'm sure this is what you think of when you think of millennials. And for us millennials, I'm sure this is what we think of when we think of Gen Z, right? We, we, keep, we keep sort of passing that blame down to the next generation. They're like, oh, they're the vapid ones. Oh, they're the self-obsessed ones. They're the ones addicted to technology. And we're gonna keep saying that for another 50 generations. Um, but it is true that these generations are changing quickly and, and they, they behave different than we behave. And when we look at the businesses we have, the products we sell, the things we market, the way consumers interact with them have changed. And I wanna show you a video to try to make this point. Um, any baseball fans? Not a lot of baseball fans. Goodness gracious, this is because I have young people. When I talk to rooms full of 60 year old white guys, everybody loves baseball. Um, well, I'm a baseball fan and I'm gonna show you a video from a baseball game. This is from an actual TV broadcast of a Major League Baseball game where the two announcers have noticed there's a group of what I think are probably high school, let's call them Gen Z girls in the audience. Um, and they have a lot to say about these girls being at the baseball game. So let's see if this will play. Selfie time. Bottom four, Chase Field, D-backs drill the Rockies 1-0. And while there, maybe they'll tweet us their fan photo, BB. Now is the time, fans. Uh, get on the uh, Twitter with a hashtag of the whole thing, AZ Data Strong Fan. Then you might see your fan photo 
and a Diamondback TV broadcast brought to you by T-Mobile. <laughs> I mean, look, look at the one on the right. Do you have to make faces when you take selfies? Wait, one more now. Oh, there you go. Better angle. This is a live TV broadcast. Oh, check it. Did that come out okay? That's the best one of the 300 pictures I've taken look, myself like, today. Every girl in the picture is locked into her phone. So, Every single one is dialed in. Welcome to parenting in 2015. <laughs> They're all just completely transfixed by the technology. David Peralta. Back to the game. Back to the girls. <laughs> oh, hold on. That's like a selfie with the This is live dog. TV. Selfie with the churro. Selfie just of the selfie. I can't even get my phone to take pictures. <laughs> Took a picture of your thumb last week. That was good. <laughs> Important part here. Here's my first bite of the churro. Not the churro Here's part. second bite of the churro. You know, the beauty so, of baseball is you can sit next to your neighbor and have a conversation. Or you can just completely ignore them. Peralta. One last line here. Knocks it into center, David, tonight. Two for two, a leadoff single here in the fourth. And nobody noticed. That's the part I love. And nobody noticed. I love that video. I think it's super funny. Um, and I love baseball. I grew up playing baseball. I go to baseball games all the time. Um, I'm from D.C., but go Phillies. Um, if anybody's, yeah, okay, at least one go Phillies. Um, here's the thing I always think of when I see this video, and it reminds me of this, this nature of, of not just the generational shift between different ages and different groups, but just in the way our culture is changing. And you listen to these guys laugh at these young women who are not even they're totally oblivious to the baseball game they just paid to go watch. And the comment I said was important is when the guy says, the beauty of going to a baseball game is you can sit and enjoy the game and interact with your neighbor. That's the beauty of the baseball game to him, right? You know what Major League Baseball doesn't need more of? 60-year-old white guys who have been fans of baseball for their entire lives. You know what Major League Baseball desperately needs more of? High school girls who want to go to baseball games. They desperately need more people who want to put pictures from baseball games on TikTok and Instagram. They would kill for that. But it looks different than what they're used to. There's this trend. There's this new shift in how we engage with products. It's so arrogant of us to tell consumers the right way to engage with the thing we're offering. The consumers get to decide. And those decisions consumers make are being influenced by what's keeping their attention. And for these girls, their attention is on their phone and their social media. And there's always some new meme and some new gift and some new trend that is spreading around online that is keeping our attention for a minute or for a day or for an hour or for a week. Does everyone remember this thing, the I'm gonna tell my kids thing, where people post memes like this? I'm gonna tell my kids this was Obama and it's the guy from Breaking Bad? Or gonna tell my kids this was Abraham Lincoln? I think that's the guy from Panic at the Disco. Um, so this is like an internet trend, right? This, this is the type of thing that pops up. Probably 20 million people made one of these and shared it online. And for like a month in late 2019, this was a thing that captivated a section of our society. Does anybody remember the Dolly Parton challenge? Does anybody do the Dolly Parton challenge? Like actually make one and post? I see at least one hand up and I'm guessing some other people don't wanna put their hands up because they don't wanna admit it. LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Tinder. This one, again, tens of millions of people made these in 2020. Every celebrity you've ever heard of has made one of these and posted it on their Instagram. And for a period of time, that capsulated our intention. I'm going to come back to this one later and talk about the Dolly Parton challenge. And of course, every day there's a new TikTok dance. Who has TikTok? See that? Again, when I talk to the 60-year-old white guys, I don't get a lot of hands when they have TikTok. But there's always some new TikTok challenge, some new dance we got to do. And as marketers, this is the stuff we're competing against. We're trying to get you to pay attention to our ad, our banner, our billboard, our TV commercial when there's this on TikTok. When there's some new challenge I got to do, some new thing I got to record of myself. And we spend so much time fighting this stuff and it's silly. We spend so much time competing. Oh, and this TikTok stuff, it seems so silly, but it's reaching hundreds of millions of people. And it's being talked about in serious publications like Esquire and Cosmopolitan and Ad Age. Of course, this stuff matters. And we see it in, in so many ways. Who watches Stranger Things? Running up that hill, right? It's like the most popular song in the world right now. It's 30 years old, but it was in season four of Stranger Things. And now it's the most popular song in the world. And watch Sex in the City. Remember when Peloton stock went down 11% because somebody died in an episode of Sex in the City? 11%. That's like a multi-billion dollar company that overnight was worth 11% less than it used to be worth. That's insane. 
But because there was this moment this happened, this weird little fad, this weird little trend that people were tweeting about and posting about and sharing, it has this impact. And this has been happening way before the internet age. It's just the internet age picked it up and made it go faster. Does anybody know where the phrase drinking the Kool-Aid comes from? Right? There was a suicide cult. If you track Kool-Aid sales over time, once people started using that expression, sales in Kool-Aid went down dramatically. Fun fact, those people didn't drink Kool-Aid to kill themselves. They just drank a mixed sugary drink. But everybody used the phrase drinking the Kool-Aid. If you don't know the story, a cult of people drank a sugary drink full of poison to commit suicide because they believed it did whatever, you know, next life or whatever. And people started saying, don't drink the Kool-Aid as an expression. Kool-Aid sales go down. That was pre-digital. Now in digital, it just accelerates. It just speeds up. So what I want to talk about, I want to talk about three things of how we can pay attention to these types of trends and fads and memes and gifts and how we can take advantage of them. I want to talk about the art of paying attention. I want to talk about low risk, risk taking. And I want to talk about outsourcing and crowdsourcing. That's what I'm going to spend the rest of my time on. So I'll start with the art of paying attention. And I think I have another video. Any Simpsons fans? Okay, more Simpsons fans than baseball fans. That's interesting. This is a clip from an old episode of The Simpsons. It's a flashback to when Homer was younger and him and his friend Barney are listening to some rock music and Grandpa Simpson comes in. I just want to share this and I'll talk about what it. What the hell are you two doing? That's called rocking out. You wouldn't understand that. You're not with it. I used to be with it. Then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it. And what's it seems weird and scary to me. It'll happen to you. I just love that line. I used to be with it, and then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it, and what's it seems weird and scary to me, and it'll happen to you. And I feel that way all the time. I talk about digital stuff for a living. I still think TikTok is just nonsense. I just don't get it. I just don't get it. But again, a billion people say I'm wrong. So it's, it's just so hard to keep up. You can't take for granted that as marketers, you know what is cool or you know what is important or you know what is trendy. I talked about Stranger Things a minute ago. I don't know if you saw the news story. Stranger Things is the, in, in a short time frame, it's the second most, season four, the second most streamed season of anything on Netflix ever behind Squid Games. Squid Games is the most watched thing on Stranger Things. Stranger Things had a billion views for season four. I think most of us think of this as like the cool thing that like young people are watching and it's on a streaming platform. It's on Netflix. It's got a billion views. Has anybody in this room ever heard, oh, there we go, of any of these three YouTube channels? Lanky Box, React, or Di Kids Diana Show? Because uh, one hand, because all three of them got a billion views last month. Individually, all three of them got a billion views last month. Unlike Stranger Things, which is going to come out twice a year or every two years, this is going to keep making content every year. These channels are making a billion dollars, a billion, or sorry, not a billion dollars, a billion views a month. They're doing what Stranger Things did in its big week when it launches its new season. I've never even heard of these things. We cannot take for granted that we know what is relevant or popular or interesting. We have to put actual effort into paying attention to these things. I said, I don't get TikTok. I don't like TikTok. I promise you, if you watched videos from these sites, you would say, I shouldn't say I promise. If you watched a video from Lanky Box, I watched some last night. Oh, they're so stupid. It's just so stupid. But a billion people say I'm wrong. So I don't get to choose, right? Just because you don't like a thing doesn't mean you get to dismiss it. We have to get rid of this notion that what we think is cool or what we think is important matters. It doesn't. We have to work harder to understand what consumers want and what consumers care about. And there's so many ways to do it. So many easy ways to do it. YouTube has a trending report. Twitter has a trending section. TikTok, the whole nature of TikTok is just to surface trending videos. There's a website called whatstrending.com. I don't know if you've ever been to it before. Easy, easy, easy ways. Once a week, once a month, go on a couple of these trending hubs for different social media sites. Go on to whatstrending.com and spend three minutes. Once a week, take three minutes to see, are there any interesting trends that I don't know about? Are there any interesting trends that maybe I can take advantage of? I'm going to talk more about taking advantage of them in a bit. But are there things that I should know that I don't know? What is the world talking about? What are young people talking about? What's the internet talking about? This is a website called Social Blade. I'm going to recap all these websites I mentioned at the end, so don't worry if you don't get it written down. So what's it called Social Blade? If you've never heard of Lanky Box, 
or any of the other channels I mentioned. And you wanna get a better sense of who are these channels that are influencing people? What are the top YouTube channels in, or Instagram channels or TikTok pages in my area, in my geography? What are the top channels in food? What are the top channels in auto? Who are these people that are reaching more people than strangers things that I've never heard of? Social Blade. Every tool I'm gonna talk about is free, no sign up, easy to use. It's just socialblade.com. You just type in stuff. You can browse around. It's super helpful to understand why these people are popular who they're popular with, and how that popularity changes over time. Social Blade. Same for use the website Moat. Moat.com. Yeah? Okay. Got at least one. Almost never see anybody who uses this website. It is one of the most handy websites for a marketer that I've ever seen. It, it's owned by Oracle now. It used to be its own thing. Another part of understanding the trends and the fads that are happening are understanding the conversations that are not just your consumers are having, but they're being pushed on your consumers. So we want to understand what are other marketers saying? What are other advertisers saying? What's the general, okay, Christmas is coming. How are other marketers talking about the holidays, talking about promoting gifts? Moat.com is a website you can go to. You can type in any brand's name, assuming the brand is big enough. Moat will attempt to find every publicly available online banner ad that that company has ever served. I just did this for, I was at a, I did a speech in a group for in the uh, meat industry, essentially. I showed them. Because if you go into Moat and you type in Impossible Foods, and Sierra Club, which is sort of anti-animal agriculture, surfaces thousands of banner ads. So you can understand my competitors, my peers, other people in the industry, how are they talking to my consumers? What are my consumers hearing every day and every week? Again, it's free, it's easy, it takes five seconds just to glance around the room and get some ideas about the conversations that are being pushed on the people we're trying to push conversations on. Who uses Google Analytics? I feel like I'm gonna get some hands here. Okay, good. Again, a little different with my 60-year-old my white guys that I talked to. Google Analytics, one of my favorite tools in the world. If, if, you're, if you're not an analyst, who's anybody an analytics expert? Nobody, want, uh, a few people thinking about putting their hands up, but not sure if I'm gonna quiz them or something. Um, most of us know a few things in Google Analytics. And the truth is most, most of the time we only need to know a few things about Google Analytics. It's such a massive platform, thousands of reports, millions of variables. I tell people though, if you wanna understand consumers better, the most important report in my mind is in the audience section of Google Analytics and more specifically under interests. This is an interest report from Google Analytics. And if you can't see, essentially what it serves up is information about what your consumers are interested in. Some of this stuff might sound trivial, but there's a lot of value to understanding if your customers like dogs or cats better, if they like rock and roll music or country music, if they like going to the beach or they like going skiing, if they like golf or if they like race cars. Again, it might sound trivial, but there's a ton of value in not only understanding that, but tracking it over time. And like can we talk about these changes in perception, these changes in attitude? It's incredibly easy to take a Google Analytics report, export it into a macro in Excel, and have it track changes over time. So you can actually look and see month over month, year over year, the people I talk to, the people who buy from me, the people who read my content, are they becoming more or less interested in X? Oh, all of a sudden, my audience is becoming way more interested in I don't know, discounts or whatever it is, or becoming way more interested in luxury goods. Tracking that stuff over time helps us understand how are people changing and specifically how are the people we care about changing. It's audience report interests. So easy to set up a macro that tracks it over time. If you don't know a lot about Google Analytics and want to know more, and there's a million ways to get trained on analytics, a million YouTube videos. But Analytics Academy, which is actually from Google, is, is one of the best trainings that's out there. And if you're just trying to get the basics, there's Google Analytics for beginners. It's a couple hours. Up-level your skills so quickly. But again, from my point of view, just knowing a few of the reports in the audience section of Google Analytics goes a long, long way if you're trying to better understand consumers and the trends and the things they care about and are paying attention to. Okay. I said I worked at Google for a long time, so this may be my Google bias coming out. But if you really want to know and you really want to pay attention to these trends, you want to know what the next big thing is, you want to know where consumer attention is, I don't think there's any way, place better to do it than by understanding what's happening on Google, what people are searching for on Google. And I think I'm probably going to get some hands for this, but who uses Google Trends? Okay. Okay. Decent, maybe a third of, third of people or so. Of all the websites I'll recommend today, all the tools, Google Trends is by far my favorite. It's by far the one I use the most, and it's the one I recommend every company I work with use. Google Trends is essentially a system that allows you to track search volume over time and to compare search volume over time of different terms. And I'll show you sort of what I mean by that. 
again, I travel around, I do a lot of conferences. One of the last ones I did was out in Napa. It was for um, the US Rice Federation. So people who make and sell rice. So I showed them some examples from Google Trends. So if you notice, these are search lines for different rice dishes, jambalaya, hop and john, and fried rice. So you go into Google Trends, you can type up to five words at a time at the top, or you can just do one, and you map search volume over time. It allows you to compare the peaks and valleys of different terms to understand, is this term more popular or that term more popular? Is this product or this brand or this attribute? In this case, which rice dishes are most popular? Where are they most popular? At what time of year do they become popular? What's the seasonality of the products I sell, the seasonality of the conversations my consumers are having? How does that change over time? This is just a big generic one for all of the United States going back five years. But you can look at it as narrow as you want. You can look in a specific state, a specific city. You can do Google or you can do YouTube. You can do mobile. You can do desktop. And when you scroll down the page, there's a lot more data. And I'll get to that in a second. But again, so many different things you can look at. This is just an example I was pulling together for this speech. And what I found when I was playing with these different terms, jambalaya, hop and john, and fried rice, I saw this gigantic yellow spike in fried rice. I don't know a lot about rice. I've never worked in rice. I wonder what that is. So I went back and I typed in fried rice. And here's the trend I found. Now, what I found is that this first sort of spike going up, that's when COVID started. Makes sense. People getting takeout, right? Fried rice is a great takeout dish. But what's that second spike? What's that second spike? The really tall, really pointy one. That's something I had no idea about. And not one person in the convention of rice people knew what it was. About 150 people in the room from rice, rice companies. Nobody had any idea. I looked it up. Did some research on fried rice around those dates. I found that it was exactly at that time that a creative director from Lululemon, nothing to do with rice, creative director from Lululemon on his personal Twitter account tweeted what I think most people consider to be a racist coronavirus parody of bat fried rice it was a chinese food box with wings coming out the side huge controversy tons of negative pr the guy eventually got fired it was a, it, it, oh sorry it was a shirt that had a bat fried rice thing on it lululemon wasn't actually selling it it was just a, a tweet this guy put out not one person in this rice industry knew about that they should have they really should have could you imagine if you're doing, let's say, contextual display targeting for your rice company, and next to an article about bat fried rice, you have a big banner ad for your fried rice product. You don't think that looks bad? You don't think it's a bad look? That the main thing people are talking about about your industry and your product is incredibly negative, and you don't even know about it. But I found out in, I don't know, three minutes on Google Trends, just typing in the, some names of rice dishes, just type in some random words, random phrases, and see what pops up. You get some fantastic ideas from it. This is cauliflower rice versus broccoli rice. What are their, what's happening with their competition? Who are we competing against? And what times of year are we competing with them? So many different things we can analyze. The thing I always recommend with people with Google Trends, and it's sort of the point of this whole section, this idea of you have to actively put effort into paying attention, the art of paying attention. You can't just assume it's going to happen. You have to put real operational rigor around some of this stuff. And what I always encourage the companies I work with is to come up with a, a system, let's call it, on Google Trends. And again, maybe it's once a week, maybe it's once a month, maybe it's five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. But every Monday, let's say, for 10 minutes, think of five things that you care about, your product, your company, your industry, your competitors, your selling points. And once a week for five, 10 minutes, go look those things up on Google Trends and see what's happening, especially find spikes and pivots and changes in demand that you don't understand. That's the stuff you need to know about. Find things you can take advantage of, find things you can speak to, figure out what your customers care about right now. But you gotta put operational rigor around it. Schedule the time to do it. Come up with a system for how you do it. This is one of my favorite examples. See, I'm giving a lot of food examples so far. I do work a lot with food companies. Um, this is a Google trend search for the word milk, the most generic and boring of terms. If you're wondering what all the little spikes are, as with virtually all foods, milk searches spike on Sundays. People search for food products before they go to the grocery store or when they're at the grocery store. Pretty simple. Nothing too crazy about this. But my favorite part of Google Trends is not the stuff up here. It's not the line graphs. It's when you scroll down the page. And again, all free, no sign up, google.com slash trends. You scroll down the page and there's a section for related queries and rising related queries. What that tells me is people who are searching the word milk what are the other things they search? What are the other questions they ask? What are the other topics they're interested in, the other products they're considering? And how is that changing over time? So I, I put in the word milk as I'm working with these dairy companies. This is from a couple of years ago. And I scroll down the page and I look at the top rising related queries. So people searching milk, 
what else do they search and what's on the rise in that category? What's new? And I look at number one on the list and I don't know if you can read it, but it says milk and Pepsi. Milk and Pepsi. This is in late 2018, I believe, December of 2018. Does anybody know why there was a rising related query for milk and Pepsi in late 2018? Nobody? Not really, no. Who said that? Laverne and Shirley. Do you know more specifically about Laverne and Shirley? Why right then? You're on... Penny Marshall died in December of 2018. And on the show Laverne and Shirley, Penny Marshall's character used to drink Pepsi mixed with milk. And now years and years later when she died, there is a month where more people on Google search for Pepsi milk than search for Diet Pepsi. Because the internet decided, the internet being the weird and wonderful place that it is, decided, that, you know what the best way to honor Penny Marshall is? Let's all talk about Pepsi milk. Let's all drink Pepsi milk. Let's share recipes for Pepsi milk. More searches than Diet Pepsi, Pepsi milk. And for one month in late 2018, milk is cool. Milk is trendy. Milk is happening and in the conversation with young people. I've worked with a lot of dairy groups. I work very regularly with the people that do got milk or did got milk. They would pay any number of millions of dollars to make milk cool for one month. You know how many of those companies did anything about Pepsi milk in December of 2018? Zero, not one. And I'm going to come back to this in just a second about what they could have done and the people who do pay attention and know how to act on this stuff. So I'm going to come back to this point, but I want to close out this section. There we go. The art of paying attention. So these are my three little takeaways and I got to read them because I don't remember them. And you got to admit how little you know about what's cool, what's important to your customers and what's trending right now. Uh, the Stranger Things is the best example I can give. That is supposed to be the new cool thing. And those three sites I pulled off YouTube, those aren't like the most popular channels on YouTube. I just picked three random ones I'd never heard of that are English speaking. It wasn't hard to find ones that have more views every month than Stranger Things gets. Admit that you don't know. And if you admit that fact, you got to understand that you got to put some work into it. It doesn't just happen. Build a playbook of resources to monitor trends like Social Blade, like Moat, like the trending pages on the social sites or what's trending.com or Google Trends and put some operational rigor into monitoring things like Google Trends. Again, schedule a time, make a checklist, do it every week, do it every month. Again, don't assume it's going to happen. This stuff takes work. You can't just, you can't just think it's, oh, I'm going to learn this stuff. I'll just browse TikTok and I'll learn this stuff. No, put some actual effort into it. Okay. Sorry, my clicker's a little slow. There we go. Low risk risk taking. So how do we take this stuff, do something different, do something weird as marketers, take, step out on a ledge, do something with something weird like Pepsi milk without actually breaking the bank, without our CEOs and CMOs looking at us like, I'm not gonna take that risk. That's crazy, that's too weird, that's too different. Low risk risk taking. Everybody ultimately wants the next big viral thing, right? Like everybody wants the next piece of content that's gonna catch on and spread and get way more bang for the buck than anything else, right? We wanna spend as little money as possible, but we want this big crazy hit. And I get asked that a lot by people when I talk about these types of topics. They say, how do I convince the people who hold the purse strings to, to be willing to risk the budget, to be willing to put the time in? And the thing I always remind people is that most of the, the biggest hits on social media, the most viral ads, the most viral content is not big, fancy produced stuff, right? Most of it is just quick and simple stuff. And if you do something that capitalizes on timeliness, capitalizes on a trend, there's such a amplification factor. And I'm gonna use Pepsi Milk as my example. Because as I just said, not one dairy company I work with, not one dairy company I know of saw this trend happen because they don't pay attention to stuff like this, no matter how much I try to make them. But some people do. One of the groups who do, and somebody said something about YouTube earlier, are digitally native influencers, including this guy, Badlands Chugs. Did anybody watch the hot dog eating contest on the 4th of July? You might have seen this guy because he won the lemonade chug contest. He used to be a professional eater. Now he has a YouTube channel called Badlands Chugs where he just drinks a whole bunch of a liquid. That's it. That's the whole plot of his YouTube channel because, again, the internet is a weird and wonderful place. The day after Penny Marshall died, or two days after, when that trend is spiking, Badlands Chugs has a video on his YouTube channel, a Pepsi milk chug. It's even captioned, RIP Penny Marshall, this chug's for you, because he understands SEO, and he understands content marketing, and he's smart. He paid attention to this little trend. The average Badlands Chug video, the three videos he launched before this one, averaged 200,000 views. That's already too many for a guy who just chugs liquid. I don't get it. 
This one had 2 million views, 2 million. 10 times the reach of his other content because it was timely, because it was relevant, because he acted on a trend. He did it quick, he did it fast. And I'm gonna sh I know you all wanna see the video. What the heck is a Pepsi Milk Chug video? I'm gonna show you the video. Um, well, I'm gonna show you part of the video. But I want you to take note as you watch this, when we talk about low risk risk taking, I want you to think to yourself, what do I think the budget was for this video he made? How much money and how much time do you think he put into like writing his script and editing it and videography and stuff like that? So I want you all to think about these as you watch this video. This is the part of the video where Badlands has mixed the Pepsi and the milk, but unfortunately has misplaced the lid for the Pepsi bottle. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is Badlands Chugs, if it'll glow. I like to stop it and leave that image on the screen. What do you think the budget was? $7? I don't know how much a Pepsi and a milk cost. How much time do you think he took writing his script and editing his professional lighting? How much, how much time do you think he spent on his wardrobe decision? A lot? Very little effort. No money. No time. Other than the five minutes he probably spends on Google Trends each day, typing in the name of different drinks to see what people are talking about. And he got 10 times the reach. 10 times the reach. The low risk, risk taking. You know the other thing that's great about digital, great about platforms like YouTube? If this video was lame, who cares? It took him five minutes. He's gonna make another one in two days. Who cares? These aren't Super Bowl ads. You don't get one shot, you get a million shots. If you're not doing something horribly offensive or racist or something, you just try to be funny or silly and you miss, who cares? People move on quick with social media. People you move on quick with digital. They move on quick with YouTube. 10 times the reach for that video. So many of the ways we can act on these trends and act on these fads are just quick and easy things. We don't have to reinvent our business, reinvent our products. Keto recipes, again, I'm staying in food. Keto recipes, the fastest growing diet trend in America for years and years and years. The most popular diet in America for years and years. Anybody like Chipotle? Anybody ever eat Chipotle bowls? For those who don't eat Chipotle bowls, I don't really eat Chipotle, but here's my understanding of a Chipotle bowl. Burrito, take the wrap away. That's basically a bowl, right? which would make it no carb, which would make it keto. But when Chipotle sees this big trend, they see, oh, everybody's talking about keto recipes. Everybody's searching for keto recipes. Everybody wants to know what restaurants are keto friendly. Well, let's start talking about our bowls differently. Let's start marketing keto bowls. They had a whole ad campaign around keto bowls. It's just a bowl. It's just the same thing. They didn't reinvent their product. They didn't fly in a bunch of new ingredients. They didn't change their business. They just said, oh, that Chipotle bowl we're selling, let's start calling it a Chipotle keto bowl because that's how people are talking. That's a fad we can take advantage of. And now when people are searching, all those searches, they're searching for what restaurants have keto-friendly options. And you see those top 10 lists we just saw in the last presentation, top 10 restaurants to eat keto at. It's probably an article someone wrote somewhere. Now all of a sudden the Chipotle keto bowl is on that list. They didn't do anything. They didn't do anything different. They just identified a conversation. They identified a trend and they leveraged it. Sorry, my clicker is very slow. Um, I'll give you one more example. This is Halo Top ice cream. Anybody read Halo Top ice cream? It's pretty good. Generally positioned as sort of a slightly healthier ice cream, right? That's the gist of Halo Top. This is what Halo Top looked like in 2015. Relatively simple packaging that emphasized three points. Seven grams of protein, 70 calories, and four grams of net carbs per serving. That's not that complicated of a message. But what they realized from their internal research is that we could actually simplify this. It would be better if we simplified this. And they look at things like Google Trends. I'm not saying they use Google Trends, but things like Google Trends. And what they find is, hey, it's 2015, heading into 2016. This trend in high protein recipes, we've actually kind of peaked. It peaked in 2015. We're actually starting to flatline, maybe coming back down. Maybe people are getting, this isn't as much of a fad, as much of a craze as it used to be. Converse, oh, did I skip a slide? Same thing with low calorie. For years, we'd watch low calorie recipes actually decline. People were less and less interested, searched less and less for low calorie meals. That's just how we stopped talking that way about health. But something happens right around 2015, 2016, that decline stops, it flatlines. It actually starts to go back up as we move towards 2017, 2018, 2019. So here I am, Halo Top, and I've got three messages on the bottom of my screen. 
I've got protein, I've got carbs, and I've got calories. And I know the protein message is maybe started, has already peaked. And I know the calorie conversation maybe is starting to pick up. So let's rebrand. Didn't change the product at all. Let's just take those three boxes and make one big box. Pretty simple, not some massive change. Granted, they did change their packaging, which obviously takes time and money and work. In 2015, with the old logo, the old packaging, they did 1.4 million in sales. They changed it to focus on one key message, the calories. In 2016, they did 44 million. In 2017, they did 350 million. They looked at trends. They looked at how people were talking about health. And they said, let's put the thing people are saying more and more right in the middle. It still says protein in the corner. I'm sure it still talks about carbs in the back. But they said, I think this is the trend. I think this is the movement. Let's be all about that thing. Let's lever Again, not changing our product. We're not putting less calories in it or anything. We're just going to yell louder about the thing you all are yelling about too. Oh. Dolly Parton challenge. I'm coming back to my Dolly Parton challenge. I gave a speech at a group called the Direct Gardeners Association in the beginning of 20. 20, I think, before COVID. And I talked about the Dolly Parton challenge and how taking advantage of these types of fads and memes is really valuable. And there was a company there called the Gardner Supply Company. It's gardeners.com. The day, or maybe it was the, definitely the week of the speech, I got an email back from the social media manager of Gardner Supply Company. Said, you know what? I decided to try that thing. I decided to try the Dolly Parton challenge, but with plants and with gardening. And she sent me an image of her Instagram. LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Tinder. A little bit edgy if we're thinking about the Tinder picture. She said it's by far the most popular post we've had on social media in months and months. There's nothing fancy. This is just four existing pictures they had. They just put it in the framework of a trending fad, of a trending topic. Most popular post they had in months. She was so excited about it. Every better company thought it was so cool and so edgy and so wild. Low risk, risk taking. This took two minutes, five, no money probably. She just reused old pictures. If it doesn't work, you post something else tomorrow. Not a big deal. Low risk, risk taking. Take advantage of these fads. Take advantage of these trends. Again, so much of the most popular content we've ever seen on social was stuff like Charlie bit my finger, where it's just filmed very cheaply, very generically, just some family taking a video. The most liked Instagram photo of all time, the egg. Is everybody aware of this? That's the most liked photo in the history of Instagram. It's got like, I forget how many it is now. I think it's like 30, uh, 32 million likes as of this picture. Um, it's just called the world record egg. If you don't know that story, it's really interesting. Some guy just said, hey, I want to see if we can get this egg to have more likes than Kylie Jenner or whatever it was. And now it's the most liked photo on Instagram. Does anybody know what the most um, retweeted tweet of all time is? It's not some big fancy thing. At least the most, this is the most retweeted English language. It's this guy saying, yo, Wendy's, how many retweets for a year of free chicken nuggets? And Wendy's replied, 18 million. This guy's tweet is the most retweeted tweet of all time. It didn't get to 18 million. I think it got like 6 million retweets. It's the most retweeted tweet of all time. The things that go viral, the things that have big effect are very easy and simple things. And I love this example, not only because it's funny, and he did get a lifetime, they did give him the free chicken nuggets anyway. Um, but this idea of taking advantage of these fads and these conversations, because when this kid did this, People started to, of course, people are talking about this. It's got 6 million retweets. Most retweeted thing of all time. Of course, people are talking about it. So now other brands that are smart look at this and they say, okay, this is about Wendy's, but can we be a part of this? United Airlines, retweet. If you get the 18 million retweets, we'll give you a free flight to take you to any Wendy's in the world in a city we serve. Good luck. You know how many retweets United normally gets on their tweets? Like 40. This has 27,000 retweets. They took advantage of a conversation that was happening. They let the whole Wendy's chicken nugget thing do all the heavy lifting. Just like Badlands Chugs let the Pepsi milk thing do all the heavy lifting. They just found a way to be a part of it, to be a part of that upward trend line. 27,000 retweets for United Airlines, a company that I assume every tweet to them on Twitter is very angry and mad. And they've got this fun, cool moment for a minute. Low risk, risk taking. And we used to look at advertising, especially when we wanted to have big, successful things go viral. We, we looked at it as, what's the, what's the biggest thing we can do? Let's get Michael Jordan, the most famous guy, the best athlete to do our Gatorade ad. And then even in the digital era, we shifted to digital, but we had that same mindset. Because then we said, oh, let, what's the biggest digital creator? Everybody know who this is? Dude Perfect. One of the biggest channels on YouTube, one of the most lucrative channels on YouTube. These five guys who just do silly sports stuff and trick shots. We say, oh, how can we work with groups like Dude Perfect? How can we work with the people that have 100 million followers? 
And now we've seen this kind of shift in the last like two, three years where people start talking about micro, or, oh, I skipped one. Hold on. Can I go back? Is that what I'm doing wrong? I'm not pointing at the, oh, if that's the whole thing I've been doing wrong. Jeez. Okay, that was, this was all on me, not the clicker. I just want to take the blame of the slow clicking. Um, we started doing this thing with micro-influencers, right? Everybody familiar with the term micro-influencers? Where we actually realized this whole shift to digital influencers, the reason we did it is because we thought they were more authentic to people. They were more trusted than the Michael Jordans of the world that felt like big time celebrity endorsements, famous people. Influencers felt like just us. But then you get dude perfect and they got 150 million subscribers and they make you know tens of millions of dollars a year. And we realized oh, that authentic authenticity sort of leaves. How do we work with micro influencers, smaller and smaller voices? And we're doing this low risk, risk taking idea. The more creators we can work with, the more cheaply we can work with them, gives us that opportunity to try these different things, to embrace these different ideas without these big risks. And that's when we see the emergence of companies like this, which I call influencer marketing platforms. Has anybody ever worked with an influencer marketing platform? Something that lets you search databases of influencers and partner with influencers at scale? A couple hands. If you haven't, they're super handy. One of the great things about most influencer marketing platforms, they're all great. I don't, you know, I'm not gonna, just the one I've used the most is called Smartfluence. What I love about Smartfluence is it lets you, just like all of these, you put in your parameters, I'm looking for somebody like this, this, and this, has an audience like this, this, and this. Here's what I want, and here's what I'm willing to pay. In the what I'm willing to pay, you can say nothing. I want this for free. You can say, I just did a big campaign with a company that sells steaks through the mail. Probably know who they are. And we did an influencer campaign where we said, we're not gonna pay anything, but we'll send you some steaks to do in your video. The number of responses we got from people on Instagram with 100, 200,000 followers, tons, way more than we could work with. People with 250, 300,000 subscribers were saying, oh yeah, I'll do it for, for a box of steaks. I'll do it for $50 of steaks. I did a, when I worked at Google once, we wanted an influencer to come speak at a conference we had in DC for an event we were doing with the government to teach them about influencers. I found a girl we really wanted to work with in Canada, a travel, a travel vlogger. She had like one and a half million subscribers on YouTube. I asked her if she would do it for free. She said, sure. She said, will you pay for my flight? And I said, yeah, oh yeah, we'll do flight and hotel. And she said, great. I would love to come to DC. I would love to meet those people. You never know. The cool thing about influencer marketing platforms is you can reach out at scale. You reach out to 100 people at once, 1,000 people at once. At a certain point, it might get unmanageable. But again, we're trying to react quickly to things. Having a, a, a bullpen of people you work with that you can automate, that you can reach out to quickly, respond to quickly, write contracts to quickly through influencer marketing platforms, super, super valuable. Point my thing at the screen and click. So low risk risk taking. Timely and relevant is almost always better than big, flashy, expensive, and time consuming. Some parts of your business are big, slow moving shifts, but other parts can pivot on a dime like Chipotle did. We didn't change our product, we just changed the way we titled it. Smaller voices are almost always seen as more authentic voices, plus the cost, they cost less and can move more quickly to speak to trends. Last section, and this one's the quickest one. Outsourcing and crowdsourcing. One thing I find interesting is that as we've watched influencer marketing, I use Google Trends for like everything, as you can see. As we've seen influencer marketing, obviously become so much more popular and so much more money going into it over the last decade. And even over the last few years, we see the idea of micro-influencers get more and more and more popular. The thing that blows me away is we, have, we almost never hear anybody talk anymore about user-generated content. In fact, we've watched user-generated content decline in a lot of cases, at least the conversation about it. Oh, click at the screen. Oh, actually, I'll come back to that. User-generated content. What I mean by this is asking our customers to do stuff for us. I worked with, I think I have a slide on GoPro in a minute, but I'm gonna talk about it now. I worked with GoPro for several years when I was out in California. They've been doing user-generated content, which if you can tell me the difference between user-generated content and micro-influencers, kudos to you, because it's the same thing. It's just you're not paying your users usually. GoPro has been doing user-generated content for about 20 years. Thousands and thousands of videos a year they leverage on their YouTube and every social platform, every website, every product demo. They just ask people to do it. Their customers like their cameras. They already have a camera. They just ask them to do it. We don't ask our consumers enough to, to speak for us, to do things for us. It's the same thing as influencers. These are my two social platforms I use the most. I'm not a big social media guy, to be honest. I got 1,000 friends on Facebook, and I got 2,000 people on LinkedIn. That's not a lot. It's 3,000 people. I'm an influencer, too. Every single one of you is an influencer. None of us influence as many people as Kylie Jenner, but we have some small set of people. 
And every one of our users, every one of our customers have some sphere of people they can influence, whether it's one person or 20 or 50 or a thousand. I don't influence all 3000 of these people, but you tell me if I didn't, if I LinkedIn post and Facebook post about something I was really passionate about, I guarantee I'd get some interest from a few people. And if we're talking about reaching out to our customers and asking them to have these conversations for us for free, our clients are, are those people we provide service to. Of course, a lot of them would be interested. Of course, a lot of them would do it for free, especially in like our modern society. I'm gonna skip the GoPro thing. I'll come to the latest thing in a second. In our modern society where people are so eager to voice their opinion, so eager to share. We pay so much money sometimes for influencer marketing when we have users at our fingertips, at our disposal all the time. Does anybody remember when Lay's launched the Do Us a Flavor campaign? They started asking people, what should our next chip flavor be? Big viral contest, user-generated content, submit a proposal, make a video about your chip flavor, write us a blog post about whatever it was, promote it yourself, get people to vote for yourself. Tons of attention, tons of case studies on it now. The first time they did it was like six or seven years ago. The two facts I love from the case study, it says the winning chip from the first one was cheesy garlic bread. The winning chip flavor, cheesy garlic bread, drove an 8% sales increase for Lay's in the three months following the competition. That's great. Here's the even better part. Sales during the campaign increased not by 3%, which I guess was the goal, but by 12%. So not when they launched the chips, just during the period where they were asking people to submit ideas and vote for chips. Just when they were asking their users to give their opinions and to get involved, their sales went up 12% of Lay's. That is a big company, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars in sales. It went up 12% just by getting people involved. And again, this is the generation that is more eager to share opinions on anything and everything than any generation we've ever seen before. This is just what came up when I typed in funny protest signs ban candy crush invites and stop premature Christmas decorating. Um, but of course your audience wants to share their opinions. And not only do they want to do that work for you of telling you what your next flavor should be, or like Doritos does with its Super Bowl ads. Doritos lets consumers make Super Bowl ads and submit them to Doritos. They also want to tell you what the next thing to care about is, like the Lay's people. They want to identify the trends for you, the fads for you, the next big thing that we've been talking about. Ask your consumers what it is. In the late 90s, Amazon, Amazon sold one thing, books. Then it started selling movies. My people prob probably know that. It started doing movies because they were packed basically the same way books were packed. So they're selling books and movies. And Jeff Bezos says, I want to sell a third thing. I want to move into a third category. What should we sell next? Just couldn't decide. Literally sent an email to 1,000 customers. What, do you, what would you like to be able to buy on Amazon? And to this day, he will tell you that there's one response he always remembers. Somebody wrote back, windshield wiper fluid because right now my car needs more windshield wiper fluid. To this day, Jeff Bezos will tell you that that is the reason Amazon sells everything. Because in that email, he realized it's not about the thing, it's about addressing a current need. What do you need now? Jeff Bezos became the richest person in the world because he asked a thousand random customers for their opinion to find out what matters right now. That's it. Send an email to a thousand people and read them. I'll just run. And again, there's so many places to have these conversations with our consumers, so many places to ask questions, so many places to get answers. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up. I feel like I've been talking for a while. Outsourcing and crowdsourcing. User-generated content is like influencer marketing, but generally free. Your customers can not only help you better speak to other customers, but they can help you figure out what to speak about by telling you what matters most to them. Yes, use Google Trends. Yes, use Mode and Social Blade. But just ask your customers what's important. Ask your customers what's trending. Ask your customers what's cool and important. And there's little to no cost to ask people for ideas, for content, and free promotion of your brand. One of the best things Lay's does, not only are you asking people for their ideas, but they're asking those people to promote the contest to other people. Those people are saying, hey, all my friends in my social sphere, my 3,000 people I'm connected to, hey, vote for me. And in saying, hey, vote for me, they're sharing a little mini ad for Lay's. And especially young people will obviously be on board. You'll be surprised at how many of your customers want to be a part of these conversations. Okay, I'm not going to summarize these again. Those are the three things I talked about. Those are five of the favorite tools I talked about, websites I like. All five of these being, uh, well, SmartFluence has some free aspects to it, um, but you know, a lot of it is a paid service. But the others, free, easy, no sign up, all that good stuff. Um, but that's really it for me. Again, it's just embracing this idea that the world truly is changing faster than ever. People are changing faster than ever. Do not take for granted that, that you know what matters, but also understand that if you know what matters to those people, you can leverage it. You can take advantage of it. Don't fight for attention with the latest 
TikTok trend. You're going to lose. You're going to lose. Be a part of it instead. And that's it. Thank you all. I can't see. Was there? Do I have time? I don't see a clock right there. Apparently, I have time for questions if anybody has questions. One over there. I wish I had the orange thing because I was really excited about this idea that we were going to throw them. Yeah. No, so that would be a pretty far one. I would hurt somebody probably. Thank you, first off. This is really insightful. So I'm a Gen Z social media manager. So all this it was just kind of like a refresher for me. But I had two questions. The first one, when you have a company or a client that can capitalize on the trends and capitalize on the viral content, but they don't have the everyday evergreen content and they cannot provide value, the risk of only doing the trending content and the things that are on the rise, how does that backfire? And then what is some suggestions you would offer when they can't figure out their brand awareness or what they represent regardless of jumping on the trends. And then the second one is with the user generated content and having the older generation who are, um, no offense to anyone here, I hope no one's offended, but with the older generation and asking them to capture the user generated content when they are technically challenged, how do you come back from that, especially when email marketing and website marketing are one of the main values and sources of information to get that news out? Okay, I think I got all that. The first question, and tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but essentially is the idea that if we're doing jumping on these fads, doing these little flighted things, these little timely things, but we don't have a broader sort of, this is who we are as a brand, this is the value we offer, this is the content we have on our site, does that backfire, how does that backfire? Um, anything anyone is ever gonna recommend to you in marketing, if you don't have a good destination at the end of the journey is gonna be way, 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 way less effective, right? I mean, it's just the simple truth of the fact. But I will say though that for sometimes for brands, even though this is backwards in a lot of ways, and you should really have good content first and a good website first and blogs and whatever, you good, good content, good services, a good brand identity. Sometimes if you're having trouble moving your company in that direction to embrace and understand that ideology, sometimes starting to drive interest, starting to drive traffic, starting to drive conversation, even though it feels backwards, sometimes that's the impetus to, to move along those other conversations, to, to point out to your leaders, hey, we drove 10,000 people to the website with this goofy little thing we did. They had nowhere to go. Like, what, what did they read? Look at our bounce rate. Look at our average time on site. It's bad. I'm finding you the people. We're, we're losing them. We're not driving them down any sort of funnel. Um, granted, this is a whole bigger conversation around having a, a brand identity and having a content strategy that are super important conversations. But I will say sometimes you can do it in reverse. Granted, everything I talked about here is more about capturing attention, more about driving interest than it is about those elements. But by no means are those elements less important. Remind me what the second question was. So with the, when you mentioned capturing user-generated content, oh, which is awesome. old people. You yeah. were passionate on old people, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So she said old people are bad um, at technology. I did not say that. That was my takeaway. Um, yeah, the, the, the first thing is, I think you'll be surprised at how many older generations are more technologically literate than you think. Um, one of the fair facts we see at YouTube, there are twice as many boomers on YouTube than there are teenagers on YouTube. Surprises a lot of people. Old people are getting better at technology. Um, I talk about all these world changing events. They happen to old people too. Of course you're right. On average, are old people less technologically savvy than young people? Of course that's true. That said, you know, if you're reaching out to people, and it depends what kind of content you're asking for. If you're asking to vote on a chip flavor, anybody can do that. You click a form, you fill in a box. If you're asking them to take a selfie video and TikTok dance, whatever, you're going to get a lot less responses from old people. And that's fine. That's fine too. Because the ones you get, honestly, will be a thousand times more endearing and a thousand times more authentic and a thousand times funnier. This sounds also like I'm bashing on old people, but some of the best viral content I've ever seen is older people from older generations trying <laughs> to embrace platforms like TikTok. There's a fantastic story. I didn't put it in here, but I encourage you to look it up. There's a place called the Cowboy Museum. It's in Oklahoma. Um, during COVID, they had to lay off their whole staff except for security. So they put their security guard in charge of their Twitter account. Um, it is just the best thing you've ever read. He's just so nice and so polite. 
He like, but he doesn't understand hashtags, doesn't understand selfies. It's just so funny. Um, but it went viral to the millionth degree because it was unexpected and it felt so authentic and real, partially because he wasn't that good at it. That's part of what made it so connecting. So yes, you're right that you will get less responses and less quality responses from certain generations or certain types of people. That doesn't mean you can't, shouldn't still ask because there are absolutely diamonds in the rough that you'll find. Hopefully that sort of answers it. Yeah. I'll also say I will hang around for a while after. So if anybody just wants to chat, like I said, I'm back in person. I just like meeting people. So come grab me if you want to talk. Yes. Thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Um, it seems like most of the examples were B2C. How does this translate to B2B, but more importantly, from my perspective, B2G? Oh, B2G. Government's the worst, aren't they? Um, <laughs> the, the one thing I'll say, and this is like a cop-out answer, but I'm just going to say it. Um, we did this a lot at Google, and we really had to embrace the idea that you know, when I first started technology, I, I talked about GoPro and Fitbit. When I first started at Google, I, my clients were like Avnet and Micron, semiconductor companies, people, a B2B tech was a bit telecom, a big part of the world I played in. And we for, worked with so many business leaders who had this conception that, you know, this person at whatever company we're selling into, who manages a $50 billion budget of whatever, they're not going to YouTube to watch a video on what's the best, you know, SSD, SSD drive or whatever. Of course they are. Of course they're doing that too. Anybody who leads any B2B organization, business organization, anybody who leads any government organization, they are also a person. And all people use social media and all people use digital and all people watch YouTube. It's just the way of the world. Um, we had a really cool article. You might be able to find this online about this woman who started a party planning company. Um, and she, one of, the, one of the first clients that reached out to her, she'd been doing it for a few months, was Beyonce's manager. This is like 10 years ago. She got a request from Beyonce's manager. She said, how did you find me? And she said, oh, just like on Google. And she said, I was so blown away that Beyonce's manager would just do a Google search for party planners. But why wouldn't she? That's, that's just, that's light. We all use Google. Of course we do. So I think that's a misconception sometimes that just because it's a big buyer or a serious organization that they won't do some of the same stuff, whether it's in their free time or personal time or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, some of this stuff changed a little bit. And again, I know this is kind of a cop-out answer happy to talk more about some examples of the fact that some of the best marketing campaigns I've seen are the ones where you get an organization who you wouldn't expect, just like the old people thing, you wouldn't expect them to be weird or funny or silly or edgy. And then they are an ad campaign. I, I talk about is my favorite ad campaign of all time. It's called dumb ways to die. It's from the Melbourne Metro Authority. It is the current agency in Australia that was tasked with getting people, less people to get hit by trains. People were dying, getting hit by trains. The most serious topic from a stodgy government organization, they made the silliest cartoon video you've ever seen of just different dumb ways to die. Like, you know, teaching yourself how to fly a plane and a little cartoon character crashes and his head falls off. Like just the silliest thing. There's this little song to it. That stuff goes a long way when it's surprising and unexpected, when you're in a serious environment, a boring environment, a conservative environment, and someone comes in with something that just doesn't match everything else. Think about everyone else who's selling to these government agencies. Think about the message they're using, the serious nature of their content. They're not doing the Dolly Parton challenge when they're trying to sell into HUD, right? But what if you were? Like, I, I'm, I'm a little bit editorializing or being a little facetious with it, maybe going too far. But I do think there's a really big value in being the one that's different from the others. And sometimes when you're selling to conservative groups, being weird or on trend or on fad is a good way to do it. So hopefully that's kind of helpful. But again, grab me if you want to talk more. Any others? Are we wrapping up? Do we have time? Time? Oh, one more. I'll try to be quick. I know I've talked for a long time. Um, you say that some of these things are low risk or, you know, low cost. And we know that as social media practitioners. But how do you convince, you were talking about how government's the worst and the content series. How do you convince your leadership to kind of get onto these trends and create some of this content when they're a bit conservative and our general messaging is serious? Um, I'll give you a quick example. Um, we work for the United States Embassy in Australia and okay. a couple of years ago we were using, we started using Salesforce and we were kind of training on how to send out email campaigns via that and someone accidentally sent a, te sent a test campaign titled Cat Pajama Party and it had a picture of a cat dressed as a cookie monster Love to it. 600 of our media contacts awesome. and it became a story and we loved it, it was an accident but our leadership didn't love it and we weren't allowed to do anything with it. So how do you kind of convince your leadership yeah. that these are opportunities? I mean, in every leadership is different. I think the two, the two quickest things I'd say are one, 
show them as many examples as you can from other people do this. The Dumb Ways to Die thing is fantastic. Um, NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic and Safety Association, if you want to do something with influencers, they did something with uh, two guys named Rhett and Link, very popular YouTube creators. They did a don't text and drive rap battle. Um, it is so good, so well produced. And then they like crash and die at the end. So it's like pretty poignant, like surprising at the end. Um, so I would say, A, find some example. Like they, that NHTSA one won like every award you can imagine and got hundreds of millions of impressions probably. So I think showing some examples of like, hey, you say we're serious, you say we're government, you say we're conservative. Let me show you other serious conservative government groups who did this and couldn't be happier. And then two, a lot of what I talk about is about doing small little things. I think how small can you start and show success? That Dolly Parton thing, the, the Gardner's company did, they leveraged that post. They I did it like the week after my speech. They did that post. They leveraged that into convincing their CEO to hire me to come in for two months and work with them on like a digital and content and social media strategy, which definitely was a little bit more not like crazy, but a little more outside the box, just because they saw that one cool little success. It was just an Instagram post, wasn't some big production, but taking like one step and having the proof is, is certainly a big part of it. Um, but again, grab me if you want to talk more, but hopefully that's just in the right direction.